Good day. Thank you for attending this webinar. Today we will look at lipid metabolism and all the disorders associated with uh, disturbances in lipid metabolism. So this is the outline of today's presentation. So firstly we will look at a uh, brief look at structure of triglycerides, cholesterol and phospholipids, and then look at the classification of lipoproteins, and then review the uh, aspects of lipoprotein metabolism, and then look at lipid investigations that may be required uh, in assessing, for example, cardiovascular risk, and look at the, the measurement of lipids and lipoproteins, and discuss the indications for lipid testing. We will then look at uh, disorders of, of lipid metabolism, uh, both secondary hyperlipidemias and primary uh, hyperlipidemias, and then we will also look at cardiovascular risk management, and then finally we will look at lipoprotein uh, deficiency. As you know, the major lipids in plasma are fatty, uh, fatty acids, triglycerides, cholesterol, and phospholipids. And these are important in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis, um, which results in uh, uh, coronary heart disease cere and cerebrovascular and peripheral vascular disease. So the reason that this we are interested in this is because uh, management of these risk factors uh, has been shown to be a benefit in reducing uh, cardiovascular disease, morbidity, and uh, mortality. So we're going to look at the structure of uh, lipids. So let's look at triglycerides first of all. So triglycerides are um, uh, should correctly be called triacylglycerols, but in common use we talk about triglycerides. So this is glycerol esterified with three long-chain fatty acids, uh, such as steric acid or palmitic acid. And these, these come from the dietary fat, but they can be synthesized in the liver and adipose tissue to provide a source of stored energy. And they can be mobilized when required, for example, during starvation. Uh, whilst the majority of fatty acids are saturated, there are certain unsaturated fatty acids that are important as precursors of prostaglandins and in the esterification of cholesterol. And triglycerides containing both uh, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids are important components of cell membranes. So we said the lipids are trig triglycerides, cholesterol and phospholipids, so let's look at cholesterol now. So cholesterol is important in uh, membrane structure and it's a precursor of steroid hormones and bile acids. And it's present in dietary fat and can be synthesized in the liver. And the synthesis is very closely regulated. And then cholesterol can be excreted in the bile as cholesterol or after metabolism uh, to bile acids. So phospholipids are another type of lipid and they're very similar to triglycerides. Uh, so if you look at the structure here you can see um, uh, the uh, remnants of the triacylglycerol structure but where the one fatty acid residue has been uh, replaced by a phosphate and a nitrogenous base, so in this case um, Choline, so very similar structure to triglycerides, except for this, this where one of the fatty acids has been replaced by a phosphate and a, and a, uh, and a nitrogenous base. So lipids are not water soluble, so they need to be uh, carried by certain proteins called lipoproteins. So this is the basic structure of of a lipoprotein. So you would have um, uh, the lipids contained within the core and then you've got an, a hydrophilic outer surface to allow it to um, uh, be carried in, in aqueous solutions. So because they're not water soluble, lipids are transported in the plasma in association with proteins. So here you can see this, there's a part that's been cut away to reveal the non-polar core of of uh, cholesterol esters and triglycerides surrounded by phospholipids and apolipoproteins so the 
So the apolipoprotein is the protein part of the lipoprotein without the lipid. Uh, albumin is a, uh, is a principal carrier of fatty acids, whereas the other lipids need to circulate uh, in complex with lipoproteins. And this, these are uh, the, the the apolipoproteins are a very important component of the of the uh, lipoproteins because they're important in regulating the metabolism of the lipoproteins. They also act as receptor uh, ligands, and uh, they also regulate enzyme activity, as we shall see. So now we're going to look at the classification of of the various lipoproteins. So we, they start off from uh, being of very low density to very high density. So the lowest density lipoprotein is a chylomicron. Uh, and then we have the very low density lipoprotein, the intermediate density lipoprotein, uh, the low density lipoprotein, and the high density lipoprotein. So these have different sizes. As you can see, the chylomicrons are, are quite large, 500 nanometers. So you can actually see them um, uh, with the naked eye, especially if they're in high concentration in serum. So when you have a lipemic uh, uh, plasma, for example. So these are all classified on the basis of their densities uh, as demonstrated by ultracentrifugal ultra separation. And as you said, the density increases from the chylomicrons to the HDL. And then you also have subclasses of these lipoproteins, for example, LDL and HDL, they are, they are subtypes. And so you can get very small, dense LDL, which is associated with an increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. So the, the intermediate density lipoprotein is normally only present in small amounts, and it can accumulate in when there are disturbances of, of lipoprotein metabolism. And this column here shows the source of all of these proteins. So you see chylomicrons come from the intestine. Uh, LDL uh, is generated from VLDL, so via IDL. So IDL is an intermediate. And the IDL is generated from catabolism of VLDL. And then HDL is made in the liver and the intestine and can also arise from the cat catabolism of, of chylomicrons and VLDL. And they all have different functions. So chylomicrons are responsible for the transport of the exogenous triglyceride, in other words, the dietary fat that you eat. Um, and then VLDL transports the endogenous triglyceride. LDL transports cholesterol. So transports cholesterol from, say, the liver to the periphery. And then HDL uh, has a function that's referred to as a reverse cholesterol transport. In other words, it takes the cholesterol in a different direction from LDL. So it, it removes uh, removes cholesterol. In other words, so it's actually the, the in, in, in common language, it's the good lipoprotein as compared to LDL, which is the bad lipoprotein because it deposits cholesterol in, 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 in the periphery, whereas HDL transports it uh, for removal. So this is why HDL, uh, high levels of HDL are associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease as compared to high levels of HDL, of LDL rather. So high levels of LDL associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease because of these uh, physiological functions that they carry out. Now we're looking at the composition of the lipoproteins. So you can see the percentages of triglyceride, cholesterol, phospholipid, phospholipid, and protein that's contained in each of these, echinomicrons, VLDL, IDL, LDL, and HDL. These percentages are approximate. If you have to remember, there's a dynamic interchange and transfer between all of these uh, lipoproteins. And then of these lipoproteins, we talked about the apolipoproteins, which is the protein component without the lipid. So there are various uh, apolipoproteins that are contained in each of these uh, lipoproteins. So for example, in chylomic chylomicrons, you have APOC, APOB48, which is derived from uh, uh, APOB100 and then APOE and APOA. And then VLDL, you have APOB100, which is also found in IDL and LDL. 
and VLDL also contains APOC, APOE, IDL contains APOE, and then HDL contains APOA, C, and E. So one can actually also use uh, these APO lipoproteins as indices of the lipoproteins themselves. So in, in addition to measuring uh, the amounts of these various lipoproteins uh, via the lipid, uh, you can also, or via ultracentrifugation, you can also measure the amount of, uh, uh, get an index of the amount of lipoproteins by assaying these apolipoproteins, usually by immunoassay. So for example, if you measure ApoB100, it will give you an indication of how much uh, low density lipoprotein is circulating. Uh, the same with uh, ApoA, for example, uh, or the same with ApoB48. Um, so these are used sometimes as uh, indices of the amount of, of lipoprotein, but we'll discuss that in more detail when we look at uh, lipid investigations. So I said that the ApoB48 is derived from ApoB100, uh, so it's produced by the same gene, but there's a process of RNA editing that takes place in the small intestine so that the, the, the protein uh, that is made for the chylomicron is a truncated protein. So there's a stop codon that's generated and so ApoB48 contains the first 48% uh, of ApoB100, uh, which is why it's called ApoB48, but it's derived from the same gene and it's generated by a process of RNA editing, where a stop codon is inserted in the small intestine to generate a small protein that ends up as being the a major apolipoprotein for the chylomicron. I should also mention that was the first example of RNA editing uh, ever described, and that was discovered at the Hammersmith Hospital in London by uh, J uh, Professor Scott's group uh, uh, some decades ago. So there's another important uh, lipoprotein called lipoprotein uh, little a. So it's a lipoprotein of uh, somewhat unknown function. It's larger and denser than low density lipoprotein, but has a similar composition, except that it contains one molecule of APO lipoprotein little a for every molecule of uh, APO B100. It uh, shows considerable, uh, the APO A part, uh, APO A lip, uh, protein shows considerable homology with plasminogen, and the concentration of LP little a in plasma varies uh, about a thousand fold between individuals and there are significant ethnic differences. Some people have very low concentrations. It's, it's look, turning out to be an important and independent risk factor for coronary heart disease, which is why there's a great deal of interest in, in it and in measuring it. But uh, at the moment, the conventional drug treatments do not affect the concentration of LP little a. But as uh, treatment, new treatments emerge, uh, there are treatments being developed to, to specifically target uh, LP little a. Uh, most, it's, it's usually not measured in conventional cardiovascular screening, but it's becoming more and more recommended that you actually uh, look at LP little a concentrations, especially if there are no other uh, risk factors that are evident because it's an independent risk factor. So now we're going to look at lipoprotein uh, metal metabolism and we're going to start off with, with chylomicrons because uh, of the importance of, of exogenous uh, dietary fat. So chylomicrons are formed uh, from dietary fat, mainly triglycerides, but also some cholesterol. And they're formed in the enterocytes in the intestine and they enter the lymphatics and reach the systemic uh, circulation via the thoracic duct. So chylomicrons are the major transport form of exogenous or dietary fat. And triglycerides make up 90% of the lipid that's contained uh, therein. So the triglycerides are removed from the chylomicrons by the actions of uh, lipoprotein lipase, which is located on the luminal uh, 
surface of the capillary endothelium of uh, adipose tissue, skeletal and cardiac muscle, and also in lactating breast. And the result is that those free fatty acids are delivered to those tissues to be used as energy substrates. Or after they get re-esterified, uh, they, 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 uh, uh, they go into storage for energy stores. And uh, lipoprotein lipase is activated by apoprotein uh, C2. So in other words, if you have an apo uh, C2 deficiency, you will have def defective activation of lipoprotein lipase, and this can also be measured. In other words, the activity of lipoprotein lipase uh, can be measured uh, if, there's, if you suspect a deficiency of APOC2. So APOA and APOB48 are synthesized in the, in the intestine, and they are present in the newly formed um, chylomicron. And then APOC2 and APOE are transferred from HDL to the chylomicrons. As the triglycerides are removed from the chylomicrons by the action of lipoprotein lipase, the particles become smaller and the cholesterol and the phospholipids, uh, the ApoA and ApoC2 are released from the surface of the particles and taken up uh, by HDL. And then the esterified uh, cholesterol is transferred uh, to the chylomicron remnants from HDL in exchange for triglycerides. And this is mediated by the cholesterol uh, ester trans uh, transfer protein, CETP. So the chylomicron remnants, uh, which have lost their triglycerides and are now enriched in these cholesterol esters, are cleared rapidly from the circulation uh, by the liver. So this process depends on uh, the, the recognition of APOE by the chylomicron uh, remnant receptors. Uh, we, we, the chylomicron remnant receptor is also known as the uh, LDL receptor related protein and they're also recognized by the LDL receptors as well. Although the major function of chylomicrons is the transport of, of uh, dietary uh, triglycerides, uh, the chylomicrons also transport cholesterol and fat soluble vitamins to the liver. So under normal circumstances, uh, you will not detect chylomicrons in the plasma, obviously, because it needs you need to have had a meal uh, in, uh, in the fasting state, that is, um, or more than 12 hours after a meal, because the chylomicrons will be formed after you have, you have ingested uh, dietary fat. So therefore, in the fasting state, if it's been more than 12 hours after a meal, you will not detect chylomicrons under normal circumstances, unless there's a defect in metabolism. So now we're going to look at a very low density lipoprotein VLDL and intermediate density lipoprotein IDL uh, metabolism. So VLDL is uh, made in the liver and it transports the endogenous triglycerides uh, from the liver um, to other tissues uh, where they get removed by the action of uh, lipoprotein lipase. At the same time, the uh, cholesterol, phospholipids and APOC and APOE are released uh, and transferred to HDL, as you can see here. By this process, uh, the VLDL then becomes intermediate density lipoprotein after it's lost its uh, it's uh, APOC and APOE uh, to HDL. And then the cholesterol is esterified in the high density lipoprotein by CETP. And, and the cholesterol esters are then transferred to IDL by the CETP uh, protein. And then some of the intermediate density lipoprotein is removed uh, by the liver but most of it has the triglycerides removed uh, 
by the hepatic uh, triglyceride lipase and and this results in conversion to low density uh, lipoprotein so you can see now how uh, VLDL becomes IDL and becomes uh, low density lipoprotein so if we look at that in more detail we said the VLDL is formed from the triglycerides synthesized in the liver which can either be de novo synthesis or by reesterification of free fatty acids and the VLDL contains uh, the cholesterol uh, ApoB, ApoC and ApoE and uh, the ApoE and some of the uh, ApoC is transferred from the circulating uh, HDL so we said it's the principal form of the, of the endogenous uh, triglyceride uh, transport and basically has a similar fate to the chylomicrons. In other words, you, it'll be acted on by uh, lipoprotein lipase. And as the particles become smaller, the phospholip phospholipids, uh, the free cholesterol in the apolipoproteins are released from their surfaces and taken up by HDL. And this converts the VLDL to a denser particle, uh, which we call IDL. And then the cholesterol that was transferred to the HDL is esterified and the cholesterol ester is transferred back to the IDL by CETP uh, in exchange for triglycerides. And then more triglycerides get removed in the liver by the hepatic triglyceride lipase. So the hepatic triglyceride lipase is located on the endothelial surface of the hepatic um, uh, endothelial cells and then we said the IDL becomes converted to LDL and which is now composed mostly of tri of cholesterol cholesterol esters ApoB100 and uh, phospholipid so some of the IDL is taken up by these uh, 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 taken up by, by the liver by the LDL receptor um, and these receptors can bind ApoB100 and ApoE, but not ApoB48. So under normal circumstances, there will be very few IDL particles in circulation because they get rapidly removed and converted to low density lipoprotein. So now we're looking at low density lipoprotein uh, metabolism. And we said that uh, LDL uh, is derived from very low density lipoprotein VLDL. So we said it's uh, LDL comes from VLDL and in the intermediate protein is IDL, in the intermediate density lipoprotein. So it comes from VLDL with an intermediate conversion to IDL before it becomes LDL. So LDL becomes, uh, LDL gets removed in the liver uh, by the LDL receptor and the LDL receptor uh, the process the recognition of LDL involves the ApoB100 protein the LDL particles uh, are then hydrolyzed by lysosomal enzymes and this releases the the free cholesterol and the free cholesterol will inhibit the HMG CoA reductase uh, which is the rate limiting step in uh, cholesterol synthesis. And it also inhibits production of new LDL uh, receptors. And it also stimulates cholest uh, cholesterol esterification by augmenting the activity of ACAT in this step here. So LDL receptors so there's another protein called PCSK9, which is pro-protein uh, convertase subtilisin kexin type 9, PCSK9. Um, so LDL receptors, uh, they bind, uh, they can bind to this PCSK9 and they can get directed to uh, the lysosome for destruction. And so that will have an effect of decreasing uh, the numbers of LDL receptors on 
on on the cell surface of the of the hepatocyte. So the more LDL receptors you have in the, on the surface of the hepatocyte, the greater will be the removal of the the low density lipoprotein, which is uh, what you want to happen. So uh, so the newer cholesterol drugs, the PCSK9 inhibitors, they target this protein here, the PCSK9, so that you can have end up with more LDL receptors sitting on the cell surface of the hepatocyte, so you can have better LDL uh, clearance. And therefore, better LDL clearance means lower LDL in the circulation, which is obviously um, a desirable uh, situation for uh, cardiovascular risk. So if we recap that again, so LDL is, is, is the main carrier of cholesterol, uh, mainly in the form of cholesterol esters, and it's formed from VLDL via IDL. Um, it can pass through the junctions between the capillary and endothelial cells, and it can bind to LDL receptors on, on the cell, cell membranes, and these LDL receptors recognize ApoB100. And this occurs both in the liver and in peripheral tissues. And this is followed by internalization and degrade, degradation in the lysosomes and the free cholesterol is released. Uh, these tissues can, like most tissues, can make cholesterol. But if the cholesterol uh, is, is delivered to the cell, um, it has the effect of inhibiting the HMG-CoA reductase. So w with the result that um, in, in healthy cells, you will only get cholesterol synthesis largely in the liver. And then the free cholesterol also stimulates its own esterification to cholesterol esters by stimulating ACAT, which is the acyl coenzyme A uh, cholesterol acyl transferase. So LDL receptors are saturable and they are sub sub subjected to um, down regulation if the intracellular cholesterol is increased. In other words, the cells have a self-regulating uh, mechanism. And the LDL receptors uh, are degraded by the lysozyme if they are bound to the PS PCSK9 protein. Uh, and macrophages derived from circulating monocytes can take up LDL as well via scavenger receptors and this process will occur at normal LDL concentrations. Uh, but it's enhanced if, for, if the LDL uh, concentrations are increased and by modification, for example, if the LDL is, is oxidized. Uh, so the uptake of the LDL by macrophages in the arterial wall is a very important event in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. So if the macrophages become overloaded with these cholesterol esters, they are converted to foam cells, which are cl the classical components of atherosclerotic plaques. So if in, in newborn, in the newborn, the plasma LDL is much lower than in the adult. And therefore, the, all the cellular cholesterol uptake is um, is receptor mediated and controlled and as as the child grows up the LDL concentration will increase and will reach the adult level uh, after puberty so now we're going to look at HDL metabolism and reverse uh, cholesterol uh, transport so the newly formed um, HDL or the nascent HDL as it's called this acquires free cholesterol uh, from extrahepatic cells. So it picks up uh, cholesterol uh, from the extrahepatic cells, uh, also from chylomicrons and from the VLDL. And HDL is then converted into a subtype of HDL called HDL3. The cholesterol is then esterified by ALCAT, which is lesser than cholesterol acyl transferase and the cholesterol cholesterol esters are transferred to a remnant lipoproteins by CETP so uh, in exchange for triglycerides so they swap the cholesterol esters for for the triglycerides 
and then the remnant uh, particles are removed uh, from the circulation by the liver and then the cholesterol uh, can be excreted in the bile as cholesterol or as bile acids so much of the HDL is is recycled uh, although some is probably taken up uh, by the liver and uh, steroidogenic tissues in other words tissues that need to synthesize steroids so to recap uh, the HDL is made uh, primarily in the liver and to a small extent in the small intestines or primarily in the liver small extent in the small intestine intestine and it's a precursor uh, so it's referred to as the nascent uh, HDL and it has phospholipid, cholesterol, ApoE and ApoA. And the uptake of cholesterol is stimulated by a protein called the ATP binding cassette protein, uh, ABCA1. So the, the, the nascent H HDL is disc shaped and is shown here as a disc. In the circulation, it acquires APOC and APOA from other lipoproteins and from the extrahepatic tissues, and then acquires a, a spherical conformation. And we said the free cholesterol is, is esterified by ALCAT, uh, and that's present in the nascent HDL, and this is activated by APOA1. And this increases the density of the of the HDL particles, so the HDL particle is converted into another uh, subtype of HDL called HDL2. So from HDL3 to HDL2. And then we said cholesterol uh, esters are transferred uh, from HDL2 to the remnant particles. Uh, in exchange for uh, triglycerides and the process is mediated by CETP here and the cholesterol esters are taken up uh, by the liver uh, in color micron remnants and IDL and these get excreted in the bile so in other words this is this is called reverse cholesterol transport because it's excreting cholesterol and so it's opposite uh, it, it doesn't the opposing function to low density uh, lipoprotein which is why it's called reverse cholesterol transport it's getting rid of cholesterol so the triglyceride rich HDL2 is converted back to HDL3 by the removal of the triglycerides uh, by hepatic uh, triglyceride uh, lipase which is located in the um, capillaries of the of the liver and then some uh, some of those some of the HDL2 is obviously used up uh, is removed by the liver and steroidogenic tissues, for example, the adrenal gland, uh, and through, res uh, through receptors that recognize ApoA1, which is one of the ApoLipoproteins. proteins. So, uh, so in summary, HDL has got two important functions. It's a source of ApoLipoproteins proteins for chylomicrons and uh, VLDL, and it mediates reverse uh, cholesterol transport, taking up cholesterol from uh, senescent cells, old cells, and other lipoproteins, and transferring it to the, to the remnant particles. And these get taken up by the liver, and then the cholesterol obviously, as you said, excreted in the bile. The other important function of HDL is that, that it, it has anti-inflammatory properties, and it transports a protein called peroxone, peroxonase, uh, which is an antioxidant. So here we're going to look at, uh, we, we get, we're going to summarize what we've covered in the uh, previous section on lipoprotein uh, metabolism. So very briefly, uh, dietary triglycerides are transported by the chylomicrons to tissues where they can be used as an energy source. And then besides the dietary triglycerides, you can have the endogenous triglycerides. That are, those are made in the liver and they get transported in VLDL and they can be made available to the tissues for energy storage. And then the cholesterol uh, that's made in the liver is transported to the tissues uh, using LDL, which is derived from VLDL. And then dietary cholesterol reaches the liver in chylomicron remnants. And then HDL takes cholesterol from the peripheral cells 
and other lipoproteins. It gets esterified by LCAT and then the cholesterol esters are transferred to remnant particles and those are taken up by the liver and the cholesterol gets excreted. So that's the reverse uh, cholesterol transport. So at birth, um, plasma cholesterol is very low. So the total cholesterol will be less than 2.6 uh, with the LDL cholesterol being less than 1.0 um, millimoles per liter. And so um, th there's a rapid increase in the first year. And then in childhood, the mean total cholesterol concentration is around 4.2 um, millimoles per liter. And in affluent societies, as you know, further increases will occur towards adulthood. So elevated plasma uh, cholesterol is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease because uh, in the majority of the people, most uh, plasma cholesterol is present in the LDL fraction. And the relationships between the cholesterol concentration and mortality from cardiovascular disease is uh, curvilinear, as shown in this figure here. The curve becomes increasingly steep as the cholesterol concentration increases. So uh, between 5.2 uh, to 6.5, it, it, uh, the uh, mortality doubles and then quadruples between 5.2 and uh, 7.8. At concentrations less than 5.2, the curve becomes very shallow. Uh, but there's no th threshold concentration uh, so this where there's no further reduction in, in in coronary heart disease mortality and then you obviously have uh, uh, in individuals other risk factors such as smoking the curve is much steeper so in some instances in some countries for example uh, for example the UK two-thirds of the adults have plasma cholesterol concentrations greater than 5.2 and about 25% have concentrations greater than 6.5. It's, it's sort of difficult to define a reference range for plasma cholesterol concentrations based on population values because of the graduation, gradual change of cardiovascular risk across uh, the entire range of, of concentrations found in the general population. It's, it's therefore better to consider an individual person's concentration in terms of their personal implication of risk for f future cardiovascular events. And th this obviously depends on other cardiovascular uh, risks or whether they have uh, already have evidence of cardiovascular disease. So in contrast to what we said about LDL, there's an inverse uh, association with uh, HDL co concentrations. So there's an inverse correlation between plasma HDL uh, concentrations and cardiovascular risk. And this uh, is attributed to the fact that the LDL particles become smaller and denser and more atherogenic as the HDL cholesterol concentration decreases. Uh, many other factors can influence LDL and HDL concentrations and we'll look at those shortly. Another factor to consider, of course, is triglycerides because hypertriglyceridemia is a cardiovascular uh, risk factor as well, although probably less important than uh, LDL cholesterol. And so the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins such as IDLs, intermediate density lipoproteins, uh, are directly atherogenic. And, and Hypertriglyceridemia is also associated with uh, the presence of small dense LDL particles which are more atherogenic than the other LDL subtypes and this is particularly noticed in type 2 uh, diabetes mellitus. So in terms of triglycerides, raised triglycerides are also associated with uh, an increased uh, risk of pancreatitis especially greater than 10 millimoles per liter and therefore um, uh, uh, this should uh, trigger an intervention if, if the triglycerides are greater than 10 millimoles per liter. And certainly if the triglycerides are greater than 20, there should be a referral to a specialist. 
We now come to lipoproteins. So triglycerides and uh, total and HDL cholesterol can be easily measured in the laboratory and uh, they can be measured uh, directly. Now, as far as LDL cholesterol is concerned, LDL cholesterol can be calculated or more commonly nowadays, it can be measured uh, directly. Now, in terms of calculating it, the most commonly used uh, equation for historical reasons is the Friede Waldt equation, although recently there have been uh, newer equations that have been developed and, and these are now being uh, recommended. So the Friede Waldt equation uh, basically subtracts the, uh, the non-LDL um, cholesterol from the total cholesterol, so it, it, it subtracts the triglyceride uh, cholesterol and the HDL cholesterol from the total cholesterol to arrive at a calculated LDL. But the problem is if the triglycerides are too high, and usually if they are more than 4.5 millimoles per liter, the equation is not valid, which is why the LDL cholesterol, the direct measurement of LDL cholesterol has, uh, uh, has been seen to be of more value. Uh, but if that's not available, then uh, it's recommended that one consider using these newer equations. So besides those that I've mentioned, the Martin and the NIH Sampson equation, there are also other equations that have been developed for uh, different populations um, elsewhere in the world. And then it's also recommended that one should one can also calculate the plasma non-HDL cholesterol simply by taking the total cholesterol uh, and subtracting the HDL cholesterol uh, from it. The calculation of the, um, the non-HDL cholesterol um, provides an alternative measure of the total uh, atherogenic lipoprotein concentration. It also has added advantages that it, it, it does not require fasting and only uses two laboratory uh, measurements. The problem with the LDL cholesterol calculation is uh, it's rel is that it's relatively imprecise because it summates the result of three separate uh, laboratory uh, assays, and it requires fasting, so it may be inconvenient uh, for the patient. In the current UK guidelines, uh, it's recommended that the the plasma non HDL uh, cholesterol rather than the LDL cholesterol concentration should be used. Uh, for the management of uh, lipid disorders. So in this instance, uh, people use the total and the HDL cholesterol concentrations as lipid parameters for the estimation of cardiovascular risk. The routine uh, laboratory assays uh, measure uh, the total cholesterol or the triglyceride concentration, uh, regardless of the lipoprotein uh, distribution. But with, uh, with those values, you can deduce the concentrations of individual lipoproteins uh, from the results. So in other words, um, if you have an increase in cholesterol, it means that there are high concentrations of lipoproteins that mostly uh, contain cholesterol, and that would, uh, for example, that would be LDL. So an increase in both the total, uh, the cholesterol and triglycerides would suggest an increase in lipoproteins that contain both lipids, for example, uh, VLDL and IDL, assuming that the patient is uh, fasting and therefore uh, the chylomicrons are not present. So lipoproteins can be quantified by ultracentrifugation, which is technically demanding and not available in, in routine labs, so largely confined to specialist uh, research labs. Uh, you can also measure lipoproteins using uh, serum electrophoresis, and this is not commonly done, but is done in a few labs in, in, uh, in some instances. And you can also analyze uh, uh, the apolipoproteins directly. So in some instances, this is useful because, for example, um, if you have an ApoE mutation in remnant hypolipoproteinemia, as we'll look at later, 
that will be useful. Uh, you can measure lipoprotein lipase and APOC2 in, con in the condition of fasting chylomicronemia. You can also look at the levels of APOB, uh, for example, in familial combined hyperlipidemia. You can also measure lipoprotein uh, little a. And then you can also look at the plasma. So if you have uh, a chylomicronemia, the plasma will appear milky. And sometimes that can be evident when at the time of phlebotomy, if the triglyceride level is very high. At plasma concentrations greater than 4 millimoles per liter, the plasma, uh, plasma will become increasingly turbid. And if it's very severe, uh, try hypertriglyceridemia, it'll appear, it'll have a milky uh, appearance. And if the plasma is left to stand, uh, the, the chylomicrons will float to the surface, <coughs> leaving a clear layer underneath. Uh, VLDL will remain in suspension, and obviously raised LDL will not scatter light, even at very high uh, plasma concentrations <coughs> that may be seen in, for example, familial um, hypercholesterolemia. There's a lot of evidence from clinical trials that reducing cholesterol uh, by any means, uh, including the use of um, HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors such as statins, uh, reduces cardiovascular uh, mortality. And so uh, this has been shown in numerous trials, both in the context of secondary prevention or primary prevention. So secondary prevention where someone has had pre-existing cardiovascular disease or uh, primary prevention when there's no evidence of uh, disease. So uh, it also, um, uh, lowering the cholesterol also reduces the risk of ischemic stroke. Uh, lowering the cholesterol does not cause an increase in mortality from other diseases, for example, uh, cancer, so it's a desirable uh, treatment goal. Uh, treatment with uh, hypercholesterolemia with statins uh, is associated with a slightly increased incidence of type 2 diabetes uh, in those where, uh, in, 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 in patients where the diagnosis was probably going to be made, for example, in, in uh, pre-diabetes or whether diabetes was imminent, but the theoretical increase in, uh, in mortality is far outweighed by the reduction in cardiovascular mortality resulting from, from the lower cholesterol. So therefore one should um, do lipid measurements in all patients who have known cardiovascular disease or those with uh, increased risk factors and where the family history is suggestive of um, an inherited disorder. So the indications for testing, so if you've got clinical evidence of cardiovascular disease, you've got a family history of premature coronary heart disease, for example, uh, under 60 years, other major risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, if there are clinical features of hyperlipidemia, if there are tendons and thromas, uh, if there's lipemia retinalis, if, there's, if there are eruptives and thromas, if the plasma appears uh, lipemic, as we've seen in the previous, uh, an example in the previous slide. And Generally, uh, it's recommended in some populations that all adults after the age of 40 uh, should have uh, uh, lipid investigations done, um, uh, even in the absence of, of disease. And it obviously depends on, on the country and the population, where if, the, if it's a country where the incidence of, of heart disease is particularly high, for example, in uh, westernized countries. We're now going to look at disorders of lipid metabolism. So uh, hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia can be primary or secondary. Uh, the secondary dyslipidemias are more common and there are various causes uh, for them. <clears throat> the common ones include 
uh, diabetes, diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, nephrotic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, obesity, for example, uh, ethanol, estrogen treatment, and those cause uh, changes in the different uh, uh, <coughs> lipoproteins, uh, depending on whether it's a change in HDL cholesterol or LDL cholesterol or triglycerides. <coughs> Hyperlipidemia um, used to be classified according to the Fredrickson uh, classification that was used by the WHO. This classification is now obsolete, and so we refer to, uh, we talk about this lipidemia as either being primary or secondary. So the secondary dyslipidemias are managed uh, according to uh, the condition, so you treat the underlying condition. So even if even if you suspect a primary dyslipidemia, it's always always important to exclude uh, a secondary cause. Although you may get um, a primary um, hyperlipidemia coexisting with a secondary cause as well, and which may exacerbate the condition. Several drugs uh, can cause or exacerbate hyperlipidemia. Uh, for example, thiazides can do that at high doses. Uh, beta blockers uh, that lack um, intrinsic, intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, retinoids, and antiretroviral drugs. Um, estrogens, especially when given to postmenopausal women, can lower plasma cholesterol concentrations, um, but may cause or exacerbate um, hypertriglyceridemia. Uh, certain progestogens that are used in oral contraceptives also have a small um, adverse effect on plasma lipids. In preparation for lipid testing, uh, patients who are not already on a lipid lowering therapy uh, the, the measurement of uh, lipids is most commonly required in the context of uh, cardiovascular uh, risk assessment. So the lipid tests required are total and HDL cholesterol, although triglycerides are included in some guidelines. Uh, the, the concentration of cholesterol uh, changes little after eating and postprandial uh, uh, hypertriglyceridemia is associated with increased uh, cardiovascular risk. Hence, the patient won't need to fast uh, before the blood sample is taken. You need uh, the 12 hour fast if you're going to do the LDL cholesterol calculation. And that should be for 12 hours with free access to water. Uh, and this is because the formula, the most commonly used, uh, the Friedewald equation or any of the other equations require uh, that there are no uh, chylomicrons present. If the patient's had a post, if it's post myocardial infarction or a stroke, you need to take the sample um, within 24 hours or after interval of three months uh, because um, the metabolism of the lipoproteins may be disturbed. Um, during the convalescent period, so the results uh, may be misleading. We're now going to look at the primary hyperlipidemias. So uh, these include familial hypercholesterolemia, polygenic hypercholesterolemia, remnant hyperlipoproteinemia, familial uh, chylomicronemia, familial hypertriglyceridemia, familial combined hyperlipidemia, and familial hyperalpha lipoproteinemia. Firstly, let's look at familial hypercholesterolemia. So, familial hypercholesterolemia is characterized by high plasma cholesterol concentrations, which are present from early childhood and, and do not depend on the, on, the, on the presence of environmental factors. It's inherited as an autosomal dominant. Uh, and the prevalence, for example, in the UK is about 1 in 250. There have been a large number of mutations uh, that have been described. More than 90% of them 
affect four genes and the genes basically the, the mutations basically affect um, LDL receptor function or the structure of ApoB so in other words affects the clearance of, of um, uh, LDL cholesterol uh, so either the uptake or the catabolism of uh, low density lipoprotein and in uh, in typical uh, heterozygotes the total cholesterol will be about uh, 7.5 to 12 uh, millimoles per liter. So the, uh, the heterozygotes, they can develop t uh, coronary heart disease 20 years earlier than the general uh, population. And in the homozygotes, uh, the cholesterol level typically, typically could be more than 15 uh, millimoles per liter. The heterozygote incidence is about one in a million. It's very rare, and in this instance, there are no functioning uh, LDL receptors. And, and these uh, individuals can develop coronary heart disease in childhood and, and uh, rarely survive into adult life if the condition is not treated. If we look at uh, familial, so looking at now, looking at polygenic hypercholesterolemia. In familial hypercholesterolemia, the distribution of plasma cholesterol in the relatives of the uh, proband, the affected patient, is mostly bimodal. And there's a clear distinction between uh, the heterozygotes and the normal. Uh, more frequently, if one studies the uh, families of, of an individual with hypercholesterolemia, there's a continuous distribution of the cholesterol values which suggests that the cholesterol uh, is uh, influenced by uh, different genes. And there are many uh, um, multiple single nucleotide polymorphisms that have been identified that influence the um, uh, cholesterol level. Again, this uh, is significant because of the relationship to the risk of coronary artery disease. And uh, the principles of managing these are very similar to those uh, for FH. Um, however, uh, in, in, in this instance, uh, dietary treatment may sometimes be enough to lower the concentration to ad acceptable levels. And obviously the cardiovascular uh, risk is much lower than in familial hypercholesterolemia. We'll now look at remnant hyperlipoproteinemia. So this is also known as familial uh, dis beta lipoproteinemia. Biochemically, uh, it's characterized by an excess of IDL, uh, intermediate density lipoprotein, IDL, and chylomicron remnants. Sometimes you can also have uh, chylomicrons present. So you will have increased total uh, cholesterol and triglycerides. Uh, and these may be uh, elevated to equivalent uh, levels. It was previously called <clears throat> broad beta uh, disease because of the appearance on uh, serum protein electrophoresis. And uh, these patients are at increased risk for cerebrovascular, coronary, coronary and peripheral artery uh, disease. Uh, they can have fat deposits in the palmar creases or they can have um, uh, tuberous uh, xanthomas. Uh, the tuberous xanthomas tend to occur over bony um, prom prominences, unlike the tendon xanthomas that you see uh, in, uh, in FH. And also they, they, these tend to be red in color, but you don't always get these signs uh, and sometimes you may get uh, eruptive uh, xanthomas. So this condition is due to a defect in the ApoE lipoprotein. So the ApoE gene has uh, certain polymorphisms and the most common uh, ApoE phenotype is E3. E3. In this instance, they have the E2, E2 ph uh, phenotype, which results in an impaired uptake of, of IDL. 
whilst the the, uh, the the polymorphism is present in in approximately one in hundred individuals, uh, the the d d disease itself doesn't commonly manifest because uh, uh, it's possibly due to that you need to have other factors present that may influence the expression. So, for example, obesity, alcohol intake, hypothyroidism, and diabetes. And also, um, uh, although you may have the mutation from birth, it may not manifest until um, uh, adult life. You can make the diagnosis from the clinical and the biochemical findings, but um, it's important to confirm uh, by doing the APOE uh, genotype. And just to mention that the abnormalities in APOE are not only confined uh, to lipid metabolism. For example, the um, in Alzheimer's disease, you have an association with the E4, uh, E4 uh, genotype. So familial chylomicronemia is, is a feature of uh, two rare types of of hyperlipidemia uh, and both are autosomal uh, recessive so either lipoprotein lipase deficiency or APOC2 deficiency so APOC2 as we said before we, when we looked at the metabolism is required for the activation of uh, lipoprotein lipase and so essentially you have a failure of chylomicron clearance uh, from from the circulation it usually presents in childhood with um, eruptive uh, xanthomas. Uh, they can have pancreatitis because of the high uh, hypertriglyceridemia, and sometimes they can have hepatosplenomegaly. They can also have lipemia uh, retinalis, which is a char characteristic uh, finding on uh, in the eye, and it's treated by uh, a low-fat diet or using medium chain fatty acids which do not require transport in chylomicrons. You can also see chylomicronemia in, um, in other patients with a genetic predisposition to hypertriglyceridemia if this is exacerbated by obesity or diabetes mellitus or hyperuricemia or alcohol and some drugs uh, for example thiazides can also have this effect. Um, recently there's been a drug uh, developed uh, that targets uh, APOC3 and and this uh, uh, inhibits APOC3 inhibits lipoprotein lipase so this drug allows lipoprotein lipase to have increased um, activity uh, the main problem here in this condition is the pancreatitis especially if the triglycerides uh, are increased above 10 millimoles per liter Looking at familial hypertriglyceridemia now, uh, this is uh, as a prevalence of about one in 600, um, and it's characterized by an excess of VLDL uh, in the plasma. It doesn't manifest until childhood. It's inherited as an autosomal uh, dominant, although in some instances there may be a polygenic um, etiology uh, the triglycerides are usually uh, less than 5 millimoles per liter, but if there are aggravating factors, obesity, alcohol, uh, they can be much higher. And you can get chylomicronemia, and you may have, uh, with the chylomicronemia, you could get uh, uh, eruptive xan xanthomas and lipemia retinalis. Um, it's not known if there's an increased risk of coronary heart disease in these patients. Uh, although they do have reduced um, HDL uh, concentrations and which may contribute and obviously with the, with the raised hypertriglyceridemia there's a risk of uh, pancreatitis. So in the case of familial combined hyperlipidemia uh, this is due to the uh, liver overproducing ApoB and that leads to increased VLD VLD, uh, VLDL secretion and therefore increased production of, of LDL from uh, v, VLDL. If you remember when we discussed uh, lipoprotein metabolism, 
how LDL is formed. So you may get an elevation of either cholesterol or triglycerides or both. In uh, affected relatives, uh, one third may have an increase in LDL, one third may have an increase in VLDL, and one third may have an increase in both uh, lipoprotein. You may get skin uh, manifestations uh, sometimes, and but in all cases, there's an increased risk of coronary heart disease. It's, it occurs at about a 1 in 200 uh, incidence. It's probably autosomal dominant. It does not have any distinctive clinical features and uh, the diagnosis is, is uh, made on the presumption based on the increase in both the total cholesterol and the triglycerides and in the absence of any other secondary causes or in the absence of, of uh, tendon uh, xanthomas. In familial uh, hyper alpha lipoproteinemia uh, there is hypercholesterolemia but this is due to an increase in uh, the HDL fraction generally the total cholesterol is more than uh, 7 millimoles per liter there will also be an increase in the LDL uh, but then one needs to measure the HDL cholesterol as well because this is important for assessing the cardiovascular risk uh, no treatment uh, for this uh, is required. Um, they may have a decreased cardiovascular risk because of the raised uh, levels of um, uh, HDL cholesterol. So this just underlines the importance, if you have this condition, the importance of actually also measuring the HDL cholesterol and not just looking at the total cholesterol. So we're going to look at uh, the treatment of hyperlipidemia very briefly because I'm I'm mindful of the time and the length of this uh, webinar so we've tried to cover as many aspects as possible so um, hypercholesterolemia the major main step treatment uh, would be the statins which are HMG CoA reductase inhibitors uh, there's also zetamibe uh, more recently the PCSK9 monoclonals have come into use they inhibit LDL receptor recycling the bile acid sequestrants are not used much anymore. There are newer treatment uh, uh, modalities that are coming in, into use, ApoB antisense oligonucleotides. There are also microsomal triglyceride transfer protein inhibitors. And in familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, there's the option of doing LDL uh, apheresis. For hypertriglyceridemia, uh, important uh, treatment modalities include uh, weight control, reducing alcohol intake, treating diabetes. Uh, the, there's the option of using fibrates uh, and fish oils, uh, which can uh, decrease VLDL synthesis. There are also newer treatment modalities uh, that are coming into being, uh, for example, directed at APOC3. We talked about briefly about high lipoprotein A. If this uh, sometimes uh, lipid apheresis can be used, uh, it can also be treated with statins and low dose uh, aspirin, and there are newer treatment modalities coming into being. Uh, for example, antisense oligonucleotide. There are We're going to briefly look at uh, several different uh, diseases associated with lipoprotein deficiency. There's A beta lipoproteinemia, which is a defect in the synthesis of ApoB and with colomicrons, VLDL and LDL absent from the plasma, and they have uh, fat malabsorption, acanth acanthocytosis of the red cells, and retinitis pigmentosa and uh, ataxic neuropathy. There's hypobeta lipoproteinemia, which is due to a partial deficiency of ApoB. Uh, you have uh, the, the colomicrons are present, uh, VLDL and LDL are present, but they're in low concentrations and the clinical features can vary from uh, no abnormality to malabsorption, uh, hepatic steatosis and fit to thrive. And then there's Tangier disease where the plasma HDL uh, concentrations are reduced and this is associated with hyperplastic orange tonsils and the accumulation of cholest uh, cholesterol esters in other reticulo 
endothelial tissues and there's increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And it's due to a loss of function mutation in the, uh, in the gene that codes for the, the ABCA uh, A1 transporter, which normally stimulates the uptake of cholesterol uh, into HDL. And we've come to the end. Uh, I've, I've used this uh, source as a reference, and I'd like to acknowledge the illustrations that I've uh, taken from that source. Thank you for your attention.